because this is the rough end of the pineapple. Uh, I'm afraid, you know, uh, things go wrong, and uh, that's what I deal with, so that's the rough end of the pineapple. <laughs> uh, some years ago, a lawyer contacted me, and he said, I represent a small company. He said, there's been a big fire. It's in a meat packing company. It's uh, all our refrigeration system went up. There's three uh, 800 horsepower compressors all burned up. He said there's been 30 experts and their lawyers who've gone there. They've torn it all apart. He said, long ago, we've been third partied in. What that means is that one of the big companies has looked around to see who else they could pull into the lawsuit and they found this little company that did temperature control on one of these motors and they were in the lawsuit because the big company says, if we're going down, mate, you're coming down with us. So that's what the story's about. And the lawyer said to me, he said, this is what we're going to do. He says, we're going to crouch down in the weeds we're going to find out what happened. We're going to pop up out of the weeds. We're going to shout it out. And we're going to back down in the weeds again and let them fight it out overhead. <laughs> and we don't come up until they're all gone. And luckily, I managed to find out what happened in this fire. And that's exactly what we did. The interesting thing is that there's a very uh, important design message from this whole thing that was completely missed in this entire lawsuit. And therefore, I can talk about it. <laughs> so anyway, that's my first one. And then I've got four more cases to show you, which show other interesting things about design. You'll find that it's very simplistic. But that's what happens. OK, so we'll see how we go. And hopefully, this will work. OK. With this motor, which is a big motor, the first thing I wanted to do, because there were all depositions taken, there were reports written, there were all kinds of opinions, the attorney said, uh, we're going to go there, but first of all, you've got to read all this stuff. So that's what I did. And the first thing you need is to find a manual. And the manual told me a lot. And I've got to get used to this. The manual told me that to grease the bearings on this motor, you put the grease in at the top and it squirts out the bottom when it's full. And there's a sealing system in order to do it. So straight away I had an idea about how this motor worked. And that was very, it turned out to be a very important thing. Because this is what happened. The operators had heard this funny noise when the motors were first installed and started. And they listened to it and they actually contacted uh, the uh, motor manufacturer because they heard this rattling noise. And it was like a thin metal noise and they didn't like what they heard. And this is what the manufacturer said. The manufacturer wrote a letter and said, don't worry about it, boys. It's OK. They all do that when they start up. In writing. <laughs> But then the noise changed, and it was more like a surging noise. And the way it was described, it's like, wow, 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 that kind of a noise. And so the operators got the maintenance in, and the maintenance used stethoscopes and listened to the bearings. But it so happens, they said they listened to both ends of the motor. But you can't listen to the drive end because there's a coupling there with a guard over it and everything. But you can listen to the other end, and they did. And the lawyers, these are all from depositions, by the way. So these are lawyers asking the questions. And they go into it in great detail. And so we had all these noises well described. And the, the operators actually were quite right. The lawyers asked them, did it sound like a bearing was going wrong? And they said, no. Because when a bearing goes wrong, and you've heard it in your wheel bearings in your car maybe, it goes grrrr. It's a grinding sort of a noise, gravelly sort of noise, and they described it. So they said it wasn't a bearing going, uh, but they didn't know what the noise was, the surging noise. And there were many expert opinions. Or, this is all directly copied out of reports from experts. 
And there's experts, like this guy at the, the top here, he says, uh, 55 years of experience and everything. And it went on and on. There were like 20 or 30 of these reports. And there was people who said it was the couplings. There were people who said it wasn't the coupling. There were, they, just, they took the couplings apart, actually, of all three motors and looked at them all. They said it was motor speed. They said it was foreign objects. There were a whole bunch of things that they said it was. And they said that it was to do with non-maintenance and uh, this kind of thing. None of them were right because none of them fitted all the evidence. No one actually took notice of the sounds. And eventually, we were asked to go and do our inspection. When we get there, all we've got is a jumbled heap of 800 horsepower motors with everything taken off them, and the rotors were out, and they were just sitting there in a warehouse. With, uh, it was several months afterwards, you see, when we were called in as third party in company. So, everything was burned up like this, and all in pieces. And so I'd already left the manual, so I wanted to see all the parts. And what I'd realized was that nobody looked at the shrouds, which were the front end and back end of the motor. But I looked at them, I managed to dig them out. They were underneath a pile of other pieces, but because I had the manual, I knew what to look for. You see that expert's toolkit, that's pretty much how they took it all apart. <laughs> Now, if you look at the top one here, you'll see at the very top, that's the non-drive end shroud, minimal heat, you see, because it's black, carbon over it. Uh, the drive end shroud, though, it's all burned up. That's had a heck of a fire on it. And the drive end has this disc on it. So now I'm quite interested in these shrouds because it's got a movable piece. And then I got interested in the end of the motors, and you see on the drive end, we've got this uh, trail of grease coming down and we don't have it here and we have grease still in the bearing. So straight away I'm really interested in why do we have a hole there anyway? <laughs> and what's the grease doing in the hole there? And then the, the thing to do in forensic engineering, the one thing is get all the bits together again, which nobody had done because nobody had ever looked at these shrouds. So I decided I'd get a whole assembly back together again on one particular motor that showed the most fire. And I worked out how this grease seal works. You see, it's a disc, it's a flapper disc spring-loaded that presses against the, uh, the face of the motor from the shroud. It's a little assembly, in other words. And then I looked at the bolts that hold the shroud on and I discovered, okay, there's shiny threads on this. And they did have the bolts for each motor put together in bags or something or other. Anyway, I could put them together. And so I see, aha, we have shiny threads, but we have different numbers of threads on each one. That is telling me that this one here wasn't done up tight, which we've just talked about with Bosch. Who talked it up? I don't know. It was a new motor, but who knows what the torque was. And that, straight away, I looked at the shroud again and I found hammer marks on the shroud and corresponding hammer marks on the face of the motor. So now I know the shroud was loose. And then on the other end of the motor, it wasn't all burned up, so I could look at the seal and how it worked. And it's a cork seal, just a disc like that, spring-loaded against the motor from the shroud. But the shroud is loose on this motor. So now I do a logic, what I call a logic sequence diagram, because I could work it out then, and you'll see that that came up in my deposition, because it's actually an exhibit. And it was pretty simple, really. You know, the bearing depends on grease, which depends on the seal. And the seal depends on the connection between the shroud and the motor, which depends on the four bolts, which have to be done up. The minute the shroud becomes loose, it starts vibrating, and the little seal starts doing this, and it lets the grease out. And once the grease starts going out, the bearing heats up, and then the grease fluidizes more, it runs out more, and we end up with a bearing with no grease. And we're still running the motor because no one realizes that's happened. 
So then what happens is you get what's called a dry running bearing. And this whole thing took me quite a short time to put together. The grease seal depends on the casing, plus the shroud, plus the bolts, plus the cork washer, plus the spring-loaded plate. So we've got all these components, and it's exactly what was talked about this morning and this afternoon, <laughs> that you have to have a minimal number of parts and look at your chain and all the rest of it. And here we have a long chain and there's bits we know aren't working. And there's a thing about called, uh, in pile and bytes terminology, separate out critical functions. And that's the issue here that's most important in design. So this is what happened anyway. Okay, that's the rest of my little logic sequence which was in the deposition and this is a summary of it. Loose bolts, the noise number one is the rattling shroud. The operators were quite correct. The motor manufacturer was wrong. They never sued the motor manufacturer because no one <laughs> realised it was anything to do with the design or the installation or anything like that, or the, I should say, the assembly of the motor. You get leaking grease, a hot star bearing, and then you get noise number two. And that's really interesting because I have an old Jaguar from 1972, had it 37 years now, and it has a dry running bearing which is on the air conditioning system. And it's a bearing that's stuck on a, up on a stalk and it, all it is is a tensioning pulley and it runs out of grease because it's greased for life but it's Jaguar. So, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so anyway, what I did for the deposition, I got one of those bearings and I put it on a stick like that and I took my stethoscope and the attorneys don't know about stethoscopes and motors and all that, so I had to explain that and how you do it with a screwdriver, you know, which we all do, you know, stick your screwdriver in your ear and hear what the engine bearings are doing and all the rest of it. So I explained all that and then I said, would you like to hear a dry running bearing? So in my deposition, I spun, I said, you all got to keep quiet. And there were 14 lawyers in this deposition, by the way, representing all these different companies, spin the old bearing and Wow, 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 wow. And they were absolutely amazed. And so was the company because they realised their operators were correct and no one had listened to what the operators had told them. So anyway, <laughs> once they'd heard that, lots of parties had done inspections, uh, lots of theories, none explained all the evidence. Uh, no one looked at the noises. No one looked at the shrouds. The noises told the whole story and the shrouds and the bolts showed the evidence and the logic sequence provided the explanation and they went out of the room during my deposition and settled the case. Boom, gone, we were gone. Just like the attorney said, we're gonna pop up, we're gonna shout out what it was, get down in the weeds and we're gone. And we were out of the case straight away. So the interesting thing from a design perspective is that it's flawed embodiment design because the grease sealing function was critical but was shared by these different bolted connections which it didn't have to be. The loosening bolts had a vibration and uh, you got a leak of grease that went to a massive fire loss. Separate out your critical functions. From my terms in engineering design terms is what you need to do. So that's my sort of robust tip number one. <laughs> Separate out your critical functions. Okay. So now I'm going to change gears and we'll go to the great hospital flood. And this is a totally different type of problem. The man's up there looking at something and that's what he's looking at. Pipe work up above the fifth floor ceiling where a valve had failed and flooded three floors of the hospital costing him around $400,000. Why? Well, what happened was I have to come back one. Uh, the valve that's over on the left corroded because they were using water that wasn't very well treated in this hospital and it just corroded out and you couldn't shut it off. And that meant you couldn't shut the water off on the fifth floor of this hospital. Why it was valved like that, I don't know. Anyway, there's a patented device, uh, this thing over here, that they found out about that you could put on a pipe and it cuts through the pipe 
and you basically what you do, you clamp the two halves together with a Teflon seal on each side of the pipe and you bolt it together and then you uh, uh, screw this thing down, it cuts through both sides of the pipe, puts a plug in it and then you've shut the water off and then you can still use it as a valve afterwards. So in theory, it's actually quite a good thing. Well, anyway, they put that thing in there. And then what happened? Uh, that just explains how it works, which I've just described to you. Uh, you can leave it in the system, but it's not a full valve. You know, you would normally do something later and, um, you know, shut the whole water system down and take it out or whatever. It, it was intended as a temporary valve, really. And it was patented. And what it did was to cut through the pipe like this. So it cut through leaving a full thickness on each ear, as it were, on each side, but right through the pipe. So it's a hole down the center with two ears. The two ears have to take the axial load. Because they had Teflon in the clamp, there's no actual clamping with jaws or anything like that that you'd, you'd sort of expect, quite frankly. <laughs> <You didn't. laughs> anyway, well, that's what happened. Uh, it pulled apart. So the ears failed in axial load and the pressure was just normal. There wasn't anything like that, uh, you know, over pressure or anything like that. And the remains of the ear are shown there, as best I can, a few thousandths of an inch thick, or millimetres, whatever you like. <laughs> Only a few of them anyway. 96% <laughs> of the tube wall removed, 4% left to take the axial load, see? And you've got Teflon in there, handy, very handy. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we measured all this stuff very carefully, and why did it pull apart? And it was simple. It, the bridge failed an axial load under normal uh, pressure, water pressure. However, a uh, lawsuit comes along, sailing along five years later, this sort of thing, and uh, uh, expert for the valve uh, device, they called it, uh, said, he was from a university, said, oh, no, no, come on, the plumber screwed it up. I'm representing a plumber. Not often I do, but I do, did. <laughs> anyway, uh, he gets thicker ears. How did he get thicker ears? It doesn't make any sense, because we'd looked at it all very carefully. Well, he was a tricky expert, did tests with a later model valve that had a smaller cutter diameter. <laughs> so he got thicker ears, all right, but we caught him out. So anyway, trial comes along, and uh, that's just to show you there's an enormous difference uh, between uh, what we actually had, which was this, and the tube that was cut by the expert, and what the patent said, which was the full thickness of the copper. And the thing is, they're trying to do different thicknesses of copper with the same cutter, actually. That's, that's part of their problem, in, not in the patent, but in the practical sense. So we, we figured that out, but then what he did, 10 days before the trial, he comes along and he says, oh, I did more testing, and it's okay. I got thicker ears, it's the plumber screwed up. And I could not for the life of me work out what on earth this guy had done and finally, I twigged to it. I read through his notes, and what he, what he did, <laughs> when you clamp it like that, you have to torque up these bolts, you see. Well, he talked them up, but he didn't talk them up. He left them loose, see. He, they were just pulled up, just nipped up, you might say. And of course, there's no water going through the thing. If you only nip it up, what happens when you pull it up tight? It squeezes the side of the pipe a little bit to make the seal. And so it didn't squeeze it sideways, and therefore he got a bigger set of ears, and that's how he did it. I caught him out the day before I testified, and I told my attorney, you know, this guy didn't do a proper test, and by God, you know, the jury picked up on that, and that was the end of him. Yeah, so, <laughs> anyway, you see, here we've got a clever concept. There was no compensation for axial load, and you'd taken all that pipe away. And not only that, but they had no real design records, no nothing. They had all kinds of mistakes on the drawings. Uh, all sorts of people had worked on the thing, all this sort of thing. The jury agreed that the plumber had done best he could, 
And anyway, the valve manufacturer paid the whole lot in the end. So, so out of this one we get, make it strong enough. <laughs> Simple enough, you know. Yeah, all right. Now, we'll, <laughs> the rubber washer case uh, is very interesting uh, for a different reason. This is an ISO 9000 uh, and one company for design and it's quite a few years ago uh, but they were proud of all that. They made fractional horsepower motors and they did it for uh, these uh, bathroom fans but which by the way they don't mind if the, <laughs> the motor's noisy for those and they did them for uh, home heating system fans as well. Uh, so those were the motors. They had 60% of the US market for these small motors. And an acoustics engineer within the company had done some testing and he discovered you can quieten these motors down if you put rubber washers on the shaft. And he, he had two types of washer that he tried quite out of the blue, a red one and a nitrile one. And the nitrile one worked and the red rubber washer didn't work. So he said, I'm just going to put it on the drawing and change the drawing and we're going to put washers on this. And he's inside the company, so it missed all the uh, project reviews that you would normally do through ISO 9000. It bypassed the whole flipping lot because he just changed the drawing and sent it to the drafts people and put it through. And he didn't know how to specify this rubber at all. It changed during the time. Okay, so ISO manual, and this is out of their company manual, says you're supposed to have design reviews and all this, just the normal ISO 9001. And normally they would do it. But I'll tell you what, here's the specification that they used for that motor. This is the actual one. So what they did, they'd made motors for years and years. So when a new order came in, all they did was make a copy of the copy of the specification and wrote across it in handwriting what this motor should have done to it. And the main thing was that it had to ship quickly. That was the main thing. So that's the specification. And here's the concept. That's all there was. That was the only drawing for this. Night trial rubber washer. Put it in, please. Okay, fine. And when it came to the deposition testimony for all these engineers, and there was a lot of testimony taken, it was amazing what they said. Because they really said, well, it's not really to do with us, you know. Okay, we just change things, and who approves the drawing? No one. And this, that, and the other. They didn't even know what an ASTM specification was. It's, it's pretty amazing for a company that had such a huge percentage of the market. And then they took the distant, uh, tip, uh, deposition of the material uh, guy who said put the washers in uh, with this uh, aud audio guy who'd done some testing and everything. And they took just what they knew about the specification and stuck it on the drawing. And they said it was a 70P135, which was actually wrong. That's a very specific specification for a specific company. And, and what happened was they ran out of that real quick and so they started changing what they used. And in actual fact, that's the detailed design drawing and, and if you can't read what the material is, you're exactly right. Nobody could. That's what it was. That's the actual one. Deposition exhibit, you see. And actually it's got two things. It says 70P135, durometer 40, which is, an, is not a material. So. For a whole year, the specification was being used on and a drawing that had improper information about the materials. And it's only even valid for one manufacturer, even if you use the right number. And they were faxing the drawing, you know, with corrections on it a year later. So for a whole year, they were manufacturing with the wrong material on, a, on the drawing, specified on the drawing. So here we've got a problem that's not defined because they never did it right back here and went through the system. Uh, we got a bad design concept because it's only one idea and who knows if it was good or bad. And we have got a concept right to production with nothing at all in between. And this is what happened in the claim. The motor manufacturer, they're the plaintiff, they said they claimed it was bad rubber. Okay, the parts supplier 
claimed it was bad rubber too, went along with the motor manufacturer, you see. We're the washer supplier, we claim bad design and bad rubber. <laughs> Because the rubber was bad, because what happened was they ran out of rubber and they went to another supplier and it didn't have any nitrile in it. And that supplier said, oh no, well this is equivalent to nitrile, but it had never been tested in a motor. So it, it actually, the motors all failed because of oil uh, degradation and they seized up and they had to recall the whole lot. It was a $30 million claim, this. And then the rubber supplier said, oh no, it was okay because you never specified it right, so we just put in an equivalent to nitrile. And everybody, all the experts were testing these motors like crazy. There were hundreds of motors being tested with all these different rubbers and everything. And uh, my opinion just was, the rubber was, to, was not to specification, so that was, was a problem, but the main failure was defective design by the plaintiff themselves. And the plaintiff backed right off. From the $30 million claimed, they backed off to seven, and the rubber supplier paid that. So not us. We're the washer supplier. <laughs> chain, of it, chain of people, you see. So a sort of a robust uh, design tip number three is use, use your systematic design procedures. They had a systematic design procedure, but they never used it, you see. They bypassed the whole of 9001 simply to be able to put on their cards, we're a 9001 company, see. Okay, now we're going grocery shopping, <laughs> changing gears again, where everything's put into plastic bags. That's my wife, actually. No, it's all right, don't worry. <laughs> Plastic bag dispenser, it, it is, but it's not part of... <laughs> they wanted the bag stand, and the bag stand, you know, where you get fruit and everything, has the plastic bags that you just pull off and tear. That's the whole idea. The company, supermarket, ordered 20 of them, went to the fabrication shop, local, uh, with a little drawing, and it was just really a sketch, with the dimensions they wanted, and they wanted four rolls of bag on the top. They discussed the dimensions and the overall concept, and that was it, and it all went out to a welder to be welded, and there were no geometric or dimensional tolerances on this thing at all. It's all done by verbal agreement, and you'd say, well, fair enough, you know, all it is is a plastic bag dispenser. Well, there it is, in a store, and this is what happened. Ambulance. This three-year-old child was shopping with grandma. Grandma pulls a bag off the bag stand, and the next thing is, the child's on the floor with a bag stand embedded in her head. And the claim was, oh, she, grandma did it. Grandma must have stumbled, tipped it over on the child and everything. But there was a witness, and the witness statements were like this. So he, it was embedded in her skull. Yeah. And it went down there. I mean, I didn't know if she was alive or dead. So this is really serious because it's a brain injury. Okay. And that's straight from the deposition of the witness. And just to show you, there's the bag stand, and that's where Grandma was, here, like the kiwi fruit, and the child was over there. And I can show you another picture here. This is from the deposition of the witness, and you can see where the witness was here, and you can see where Grandma was there, and you can see where the child was there. Okay, so we actually had a pretty good description of it, of what happened. And so now, looking at it from grandma's perspective, grandma's here pulling on one of those plastic bags. We don't know if it was a top or bottom, but obviously it was one or other of those in that direction. It's very important to see which direction she's pulling in this way. See, pulling the sort of skewed on the, on the roll. Okay, just, this is just the relative sizes, and we had the sizes of the people. So that's grandma, that's the bag stand, and that's the child, just to give you the reference of the sizes. And this is what happened. What we worked out is that this thing is 2.2 degrees off vertical. So, so what it does is, uh, okay, 
Uh, how can I do it? Okay, grandma's like this, the little child's here, bag stands here. Grandma pulls it like this, and the bag com roll comes to the end, and the thing tips a little bit. She tears it off, and it goes back like this, but it keeps going right over. So it's like this. It goes this way, okay, goes back, and then keeps going right over, all in one go. And we did tests on it. That's exactly what it did. And the problem is this 2.2 2 degrees off vertical creates this unique characteristic. Uh, it's, it's enough to tip the thing over. Now, we all know it's unstable. You know, uh, a lot of these bag stands are. You've got to watch them uh, because they're so high and they've got a solid base, but it may not be that big a diameter. Uh, nevertheless, this one had this unique thing that happened. Now, how vertical is vertical is the issue, see? <laughs> There's no geometric tolerances, so now it relies totally on what people say. And the welder said, I made him, stand, I made him vertical. Yeah, well, vertical to him is from a welder's perspective looking at it. Who knows if he looked at it in both directions? We don't know. But to him, they were vertical. Not only that, but they were all brought into the store together, and the manager said they looked vertical to him. But how would you, if you had 20 of them, how would you know that one of them is slightly off, and maybe all of them were off? Because two degrees is not much if you're guessing verticality. I wouldn't have thought, unless you had a jig or a fixture to hold it that way. And they sort of could, had to forget about blaming grandma because it was obvious what happened, and the child wasn't involved, and this, uh, Weber or Weber's law is a very interesting thing, the just noticeable difference. And it also comes into some of what we were talking about, feel and touch and everything this morning. Because the just noticeable difference is, is a thing that if it's a certain thing to your brain that tells you is that vertical or not. And it varies between people depending on their experience and their history. And you cannot use that during design, you know. That's not an acceptable approach. So that's the point with this one. Now they have a big circular base on it. They still use it just the same way, but they have a big circular base. So anyway, tip number four is take <laughs> takes tolerancing seriously. Uh, even if it's just a sketch of something, you need to think about these things. Okay, the next is a high pressure washer. And some of you may have used them. Uh, they are very high pressure. Uh, in American terms, uh, 4,000 PSI pretty much. Just water, spray your house or whatever with them. And they're very common in the US. And they have a gasoline, as they call them in America, petrol in Britain, engine uh, that just drives a pump. And they pump the water out through a high pressure hose. And you have this gun on the end. And this is what happened with this one. Lab technician loses eye. So what happened was they'd used it all day. Uh, they, they turn the thing off. Uh, it's a brand new washer. Uh, they chuck the instructions away because they had another one. They already <laughs> knew how to use it. Uh, he finished for the day, put it on a truck with a mate of his, came back and had no one to help him, unloaded off the tray of this truck. It wasn't a big truck. It, was, it had a tray about so high. So anyway, he went into the office uh, and, and asked if someone would help unload it. And this uh, woman comes out who he knew and we had worked with and everything, and she helped him just lift this thing off and down onto the ground, and then this accident happened and she got lost an eye. So the whole issue was what actually happened. So, uh, I can go to the next slide. The depositions, and these are the actual words out of the deposition, that's why there's so many words, because I, I did want you to read what they said, because some of it's quite important. When we set it down, there's a hose attached to the unit that goes to the wand, that's the gun. The machine was not on, it wasn't hooked to anything, it was just by itself, no motor running. And so she's down there, so she lowers it down like this with him beside her, and that's where it happened, as far as she's concerned. The hose was beneath my feet. Huh, that's interesting, because it's supposed to be coiled up. You remember that. And uh, Jimmy was still bent over. He moved the wand, and the next thing it fired. Hmm, that's interesting. How did it fire? Okay, 
Two things of interest in there. All right, next one. The driver, who was the other person lifting it off, said this. We were pulling it out of the back of the tailgate. We set it down. The wand had fallen off. Another point to remember. I went to pick it up, and when I picked it up, I picked it by the handle. Another point to remember. And boom, it just went off and got her above the eye. Hmm, that's interesting. That's interesting geometry, see? How high did you lift it off the ground before the water discharge? Maybe two or three feet. So he's, so he's down on the ground, the wand's down here. He picks it up by the handle, and he's got the handle two or three feet above the ground. But she gets it in the eye, and she's just standing up, see? Okay, next thing. Whoop. Next question. And in what direction was the nozzle end? And he says, away from me, okay? It was up towards the air. Okay, you'd gotten the wand two or three feet above the ground. Well, the back part, yet the handle. So he's got the handle two or three feet above, and he's talking about it being pointed in an upward direction. Yes. That is the key to this whole case. All right, so we keep going. I then went with the attorney to inspect this device and had a look at it all. And I went up to the manufacturer and had a look at an exemplar. So we could do tests and everything, and I did. The manufacturer said, uh, well, you know, we've tried these flow uh, actuated uh, uh, unloaders. And what that does is if you shut the machine off or whatever, and you've still got uh, pressure between the machine and the wand, then it will automatically unload it. They've done all this testing and found that if you have any salts in the water or anything, it bungs up and stops working after a very short time. So they knew about all that, but the plaintiff was f very forceful about the fact that they should have one. And so the attorney was asking him, you know, these very pointed questions. Until you purge the gun, there's water trapped. If you had a flow uh, actuated unloader, that would not be the case, would it? That's correct. The minute he said that, the company thought they were in for millions. And they were, they were really worried. And that's why I got called in and we went to do this inspection. And I did these testings and everything. But that, that was the problem. <laughs> uh, now, this manufacturer in Wisconsin is a really good manufacturer. There's no question about that. They have a really good design process. They have all the records. They do everything right. They buy specialty items in. They go through all the safety of it. The prototypes are tested against the specification. You'd think they were doing everything according to the design book, you might say. <laughs> the plaintiff's expert wiped them out on this. Should have had a flow actuated unloader, which they'd tested and consciously decided not to use, which the plaintiff's attorney loved. He thought that was great, until I came along. <laughs> I did these tests, uh, and I found that, you know, if you unload it, it's only like four pounds to pull the trigger. But if you have pressure in the hose, it's like 25 pound pull. It's quite a lot. So you know you're pulling it if there's water in the hose. It's telling you, I'm still loaded, mate, you know. You pull the trigger once and unload it, and then, whew, it's easy. So these type of things, and I checked how much water came out and that sort of thing as well. A whole bunch of tests. All right. Then I did some hose tests with the power off, but pressurized. And what I discovered was this is a very thick-walled hose because it's high pressure. And if you try to coil it up onto the back of the machine, which is like this, there's hooks on there, and you coil it up like this, it, you can get about two coils on and the thing leaps off because it forms a figure of eight and comes off. It doesn't want to be coiled up. It simply, you, you can hardly make it go onto the hooks and coil it up. And if you do and you put the wand there, the wand flips off again. So I'd done that test and the easiest way to deal with it, pull the trigger. 25 pounds, unload it, you can coil it up perfectly. So it's telling you also, I am still full of water, I can't, un I, you're not allowed to coil me until you've unloaded it. Pull me with the 25 pounds and then I, I'll be happy, see. It's telling you that. All right. 
Now we have this thing called the safety hierarchy, and pile and bites, you know, that I'm very familiar with, say it in a different way, but in America, the attorneys have all learnt this, so they, they love this thing, and they, they're always on about the safety hierarchy and all the rest of it, because they actually understand, you know, what it means, and it's basically eliminate hazard or risk if you can, if you can't or want to anyway, apply safeguarding technology. Uh, if you have to, use warning signs. You always should do training and instruction if you can do it and prescribe personal protection in the last resort. Okay. So I said to this attorney when we did our inspection, you know, there's something funny about all this. Let's look at it a bit more carefully. We're in the basement of this uh, public uh, utilities uh, facility and we weren't allowed to turn the thing on, the actual one, but we were allowed to look at it. We weren't allowed to take it to pieces or anything like that. Um, but I said, you watch this. So I said, safety hierarchy level one, Does, what about the design of the thing, direct approach? Well, the hose twists up and you can't coil it under pressure. The gun points to the ground when you pick it up by the handle. If you pick it up, even with the hose and everything attached, it always points to the ground. And so the centre of gravity, and I showed it to him, you know, I did a little demonstration while there, and I got him to hold it too. And then it's got a trigger guard. And if you, the trigger guard is such that if you're holding it like this, it just flips. I'll show you in a minute. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> beautiful. Anyway, we'll keep going. So now, I say, okay, you pick it up. There it is, point, that's the attorney himself at my inspection. Oh, good heavens, he says. Yeah, all right. All words to that effect. And then I showed him, I just got my little tape measure, <laughs> stuck it on a box, and I said, look where the center of gravity of the thing is, with the hose attached, I said. Okay. Level two, apply safeguarding technology. Oh, the thing's got a beautiful trigger guard on it. It protects the trigger, it locks in a natural position, and it's an over-centered device, so you've got to do something to get it off that. And also, the hose couplings are all locked, so you can't undo the hose when it's all pressurized. So now we've got a whole series of things that the machine itself is telling us. And we're down two levels in the hierarchy. Look, here's the trigger lock. That's its stowed position. That's when you're using it. And here's, your finger just comes on this little button thing and it just flips it down. It's almost a natural thing to do. And there it is in the over-centre device. Uh, position, I mean. Okay, so now what about warnings? Well, there's warnings all over this thing. You know, about not, don't squirt people, don't, get, don't stick your hand on the motor, you might get burned, and it's 3,700 PSI, and all these sort of things. And there's even an embossed one on the handle because <laughs> the US government requires it. And you can't really read it, it's like that, but if you blow it up, then you can. And the, very, the most interesting thing about this is it says, made in Italy. That's the most interesting thing. Okay, and then the other side of it says this, caution, high pressure, do not point at the body. <laughs> All these things. Well, you know, I know they have it embossed and you can't read it without your glasses, but it is on there. And then uh, here it says, please read the manual. And it said on the last one, please read the manual. And when you go to the manual, it, the manual says, please read the manual too. Manual says. <laughs> this is called training and instruction, you see. Warning uh, operator. And the manual tells you how to use the trigger. Of course, it tells you not to spray people with it. And it tells you to relieve the pressure. And it tells you about squeezing the thing. So it's all in there. But they threw the instructions away, you remember, because they knew all about this machine, because they'd had another one uh, earlier on. And so in the manual, there's a whole set of other warnings. There's pages of it, pages and pages. It's like when you buy a new car, you know, in the first 50 pages of what not to do before you can find out how to start it, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, level five, funnily enough, they even provide goggles with the machine too. So even that safety protection was provided with this machine. And the manual said, wear goggles. <laughs> okay. So I said to the attorney and I said to the company, you know, this is a beautiful design. It does everything. Everything in the safety hierarchy has been addressed by someone on purpose. They've done it consciously. 
I said, and it's Italian. And what happened is this company buys this gun, wand, from Italy, brings it in, it installs it, but it's not part of their design process. You see, they just add it on to their hose. So here we have a company that does all the systematic design and reviews and everything, but it's not holistic. They missed out the key part, which is the gun, where all the safety is. So they've done all the nice design of the engine and safeties on that and everything, and they didn't understand about it. It took me ages to get across to them. There's absolutely nothing wrong with their design, and that's not what caused the accident. These two people knew each other, he squirted her because the gun points at the ground, but he said it was up in the air. You've got to put a force on that wand in order to get it up in the air. He lifted it and squirted her in the eye. No, not intentionally. I mean, he squirted her thinking it'll just go fat. But of course, you know, it doesn't. It's 4,000 PSI. So the design is excellent, but they're fooling around. And the case settled straight away. I never did any more on it. That was the end of it. I only did the inspection with the attorney. That's it. But it, from a design perspective, it's really interesting, you see. So, so understand your own engineering design is what I say. You need to actually understand what you've done because you may have done a better job than you think, like they did. And there's my five tips. Thank you very much. Thank you. New and interesting cases for me to hear. Peter, can you just flick the lights on your way out? Sorry. Thanks very much. Are there any questions for Chris? Yes. Wouldn't the pressure of the gun have caused the gun to rise? No, in actual fact, that was one of the tests I did, you know, because I was allowed to use it with pressure. I, I actually cut down my slides uh, to fit the time and everything, but I had another slide which showed me actually using it and squirting into a, uh, into a to measure, you know, into a measuring flask. So, uh, good point, but no, it didn't, it, it might have affected it only a little bit, but it pointed to the ground. Thank you very much for a very great and entertaining talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.